Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Samir Parekh. I am an associate professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, and I'm a part of the Medical Advisory Board for the CLL Society, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Thompson. Dr. Thompson is an assistant attending at the Memorial Sloan uh, Cancer Center, Kettering Cancer Center, MSKCC uh, in New York. Dr. Thompson, thank you very much for taking the time uh, this morning to talk to us about your abstract that is titled Outcomes of Therapies and Resistance Mutations Following Non-Covalent BTK Inhibitor Treatment for Patients with Chronic Lymphocytic Leukemia and Richter Transformation. Uh, Dr. Thompson presented this as a poster at the ASH 2022 meeting. So Dr. Thompson, thank you very much again for your time. Could you please tell us uh, what you learned uh, in this study? Yeah, thanks so much um, for the opportunity to uh, discuss this. So uh, really as background, um, this study focused on patients who were treated with a non-covalent BTK inhibitor for diagnosis of CLL or Richter transformation, and then discontinued that therapy and went on to get another line of therapy afterwards. Um, really as background, the non-covalent BTK inhibitor class uh, was designed in part to uh, overcome some of the limitations of covalent BTK inhibitors, drugs such as abrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib, um, that are very effective uh, standard of care approved therapies for CLL in the frontline and relapse refractory setting now. Um, but have limitations, including discontinuation for side effects, as well as the development of acquired uh, resistance, including mutations at the actual site where the drug binds. So non-covalent BTK inhibitors have shown great promise in clinical trials for, for patients with both CLL and Richter's. Um, examples of these drugs include uh, pirtabrutinib, which is the furthest along in, in clinical development right now. Um, other drugs uh, include nemtabrutinib, and there's been a couple of others tested um, in early phase clinical trials. But one uh, challenge we're seeing with patients, um, you know, despite uh, excellent early safety data and clinical outcomes with non-covalent inhibitors, including pirtabrutinib, is that these patients who are treated with the non-covalent inhibitors do um, uh, a subset have developed uh, resistance uh, to the drugs and or needed to discontinue them for other reasons. Um, and right now in the clinic, um, we don't have any data to guide treatment selection following, the, following these agents. So this study really was taking a retrospective look um, at, uh, and it was an international multi-center effort. Um, so looking at several centers, who uh, were involved with clinical trials of these uh, non-covalent BTK inhibitors and looking at patients with CLL or Richter transformation who were treated with a non-covalent inhibitor and discontinued therapy. And then um, we looked at outcomes of the next line of treatment. Um, so this is in general, a pretty heavily pretreated patient population, um, median of four prior therapies. Um, we had, when we looked at these patients, they had um, cited genetic and molecular complexity, so some high-risk features such as TP53 mutation. Um, many patients also had resistance mutations to covalent BTK inhibitors, um, and almost everyone um, had had a prior covalent BTK inhibitor, and the majority of patients had also had prior venetoclax, one of the other standards of care for CLL. Most patients did discontinue the non-covalent inhibitor for disease progression. And then to kind of summarize our findings about the therapies after the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, we found that for CLL patients, patients who had not received prior venetoclax did respond to venetoclax. There was an overall response rate of 70% um, following um, the non-covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, and so uh, this was really the first, this is really the first time that this has been reported that venetoclax has clinical activity following a non-covalent BTK inhibitor and could be important for how um, we decide to sequence uh, covalent, non-covalent BTK inhibitors and venetoclax in the future. And then the other things that we saw were that treatments such as chemoimmunotherapy for both Richter's and CLL really 
um, had poor outcomes. Um, and these are, you know, some of the standard available therapies, um, uh, but uh, have not yielded uh, great outcomes in this patient population. And then we did see that uh, some emerging therapies, such as CAR T cell therapy, um, did have a high overall response rate, um, although it was short follow up. Um, so, kind of as a first look here about how we manage these patients, um, we were able to see that we definitely have an unmet need here for CLL and Richter's patients, um, and that cellular therapy might be a good, that might be a should be further um, investigated in clinical trials, um, and that chemotherapy really is not yielding good outcomes for these patients. Yeah, no, that's a very, um, very good um, summary. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. So I think, you know, as our patients um, have gone through different types of treatment programs, I think, you know, uh, because BTK inhibitors, the covalent BTK inhibitors, namely ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanubrutinib, the three most commonly available BTK inhibitors, I think the question really in the minds of patients is, you know, if and when I do have progression of disease on these agents, if I'm given an option of a non-covalent BTK inhibitor such as pertubrutinib or nemtubrutinib, and both of these are actually available in the context only of a clinical trial right now because none of these are approved, I think these data are reassuring that you can save venetoclax in the back pocket for future use because uh, venetoclax does seem to have a response after progression on a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, which I think is very important. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think uh, I think that these data are just an early look. We need you know more and more patients, but I think it'll be definitely an emerging question. Um, in the field about, you know, whether we stay with a covalent to non-covalent BTK inhibitor before going to venetoclax, which I do think, you know, there are arguments to go either way, but um, right. I think at least we've shown here that that concept maybe makes sense to stay within the same class. Absolutely. One of the questions that always comes up as, as we take care of patients in the clinic is, you know, we've all seen and heard about uh, side effects from the covalent BTK inhibitors, uh, you know, AFib and hypertension, et cetera. Uh, what proportion of patients in this study stopped their non-covalent BTK inhibitors for toxicity? And could you tell us about some of the major toxicities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so... It, in general, it's still pretty early days. You know, I'll have the disclaimer for the non-covalent inhibitors because, as you mentioned, they're not approved. They're still in clinical trials. So, you know, most of the, the data we have, these are all clinical trial patients um, that that are reflected um, on various trials in the in this study. Um, but in general, there's about a two percent discontinuation discontinuation rate for uh, adverse events for pirtubrutinib in in hundreds of patients so far far across not just CLL, but other um, histologies treated. Um, Nemtubrutinib had a little bit, um, we haven't seen updated data for a while in CLL, but had, had a little bit more um, discontinuations for toxicity when that data was presented. Um, in this study, uh, uh, four patients uh, discontinued um, for uh, toxicity out of uh, 63 patients, so uh, pretty consistent with what we saw, uh, maybe a little even less than the most updated clinical trial data. But it does appear, and it's very BTK inhibitor specific, as we've seen with the covalent inhibitors, what the safety profile of the non-covalent inhibitors is. But um, in general, um, pirtubrutinib has, uh, has been very well tolerated. We have a lot of patients here um, treated on the phase one, uh, two study at Memorial. And um, one of the most common really grade three or higher AEs is neutropenia, um, but it's easily managed with um, uh, growth factor support like the white blood cell boosters like Nubigen or Nulasta. Um, and then some of the other toxicities you mentioned like bleeding or atrial fibrillation haven't had as higher rates so far with the early data as the covalent, some yeah. of the covalent inhibitors. Yeah, and these data are very reassuring. Uh, and, and I think um, they just speak to the uh, molecule that is being used because uh, I agree we have uh, patients here on these trials as well, and uh, they seem to be tolerating this agent very well. 
Um, I think, you know, thank you again very much, Dr. Thompson, for your time. Any, any closing thoughts uh, uh, about uh, this particular abstract and the work that you've led? Um, no, I mean, I think that this uh, work is really um, a great example of how the CLL community um, of physicians comes together to really, uh, on an international level, um, you know, draw upon our experience and and take an early look at kind of the future and the next questions that we'll be answering. Um, so we're definitely in the early days, you know, not that many patients have discontinued the non-covalent inhibitors, but I think a message to patients is that there's great collaboration and research going on, um, you know, even, even for investigational therapies, thinking about the next step for patients. Um, and so it's it's really been um, uh, rewarding to be part of this this huge huge team effort um, and a lot of a lot of hope for new therapies for patients. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.